focus on today. But then he takes the teaching moment a little bit deeper, and that's where we're going to go next week, and, and then there's a story involved in it. But Mark chapter 8, verse 11 says, and I'm reading out of the New King James Version. I think they might, I think I might have told them the wrong version. But anyway, if you have the NIV, New King James, whatever. Uh, it says, then the Pharisees came out and began to dispute with him. The Pharisees came out uh, and probably came out from Jerusalem where they lived and began to dispute with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven, testing him. But he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Surely I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. I want to talk to you today about uh, being addicted to assurances. I think you could probably subtitle today's message uh, if you wanted to. Um, being addicted to assurances. You could subtitle it the, the pointless pursuit of proof. <laughs> uh, I got three P's there. I only had two A's before, so I don't know which, which, which is better. But I feel like, I feel like this, there, there's, there's this, this, this pointless pursuit of truth that the Pharisees are on. They are addicted to assurances because, mind you, this passage... Uh, Mark chapter 8 verse 11 comes after uh, all eight chapters, seven previous chapters of Mark, including the beginning of chapter 8, where he just fed 4,000 people with some loaves and fishes. I would call that a sign, maybe. Prior to that, he had fed 5,000 people with some loaves and fishes. Mark is the only one who records these two feeding miracles. And it's, it's interesting. I would call those signs. In fact, John in his gospel does call that a sign. Uh, in Mark chapter 5 alone, Mark tells us about a time when Jesus calmed the winds and the waves, calmed the storm, just with the word from his mouth. He stretched out his hand, just stopped. He has control over nature. That feels kind of sign-ish. Uh, within chapter 5, he also cast out demons in a man that had a legion, roughly 2,000 demons possessing him. And the word about that spread throughout the entire countryside. He then, in Mark chapter 5, went back across the, the, the Sea of Galilee where he healed a woman who had, had an issue of blood for 12 years. Then he raised a little girl from the dead. So Mark has given us several Opportunities. In fact, that's the whole point of Mark. The whole point of the Gospel of Mark is that you might believe that Jesus is who he says that he is, that he is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God. And he's been laying out evidence ever since chapter 1 from the baptism of Jesus where he came up out of the water and a voice thundered from heaven saying, this is my son. That's kind of a sign. Ever since like chapter 1, he's been laying out evidence for us that Jesus is who he says that he is. And now we have these Pharisees who come down and they are seeking a sign. I don't know if you've ever had some thoughts come down that starts demanding, like, so, so Jesus, notice it said they came to dispute with him. They came to argue with him. And so, man, I've had some, like, I've, I've, I've seen God do some things, but even on the heels of having seen him do some things, I've still had some thoughts that wanted to argue, <laughs> that wanted to dispute with the truth, because Jesus is the truth. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And so I've had some thoughts personally that have argued with what I know to be true. So I, I, I don't want to be too harsh on the Pharisees because I too have seen evidence of God in my life and still said, yeah, but... <laughs> yeah, but what about... Yeah, but I've still demanded more evidence, more assurance. And what Jesus is saying is not that he's not willing to show up and show out in your life. Not that he's not willing to reveal himself to you and do great things. But what he's saying is if what he has already done is not enough, you ain't never gonna know me. I'm just saying, is if, if you don't know him by now, like if it just, if it hasn't clicked yet, 
<laughs> you, didn't, you didn't know what I was singing. I need to just quote the words, not sing them. It, it, like, he's saying, if you don't know me, like, like the, 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 there's not going to be any amount of evidence that's going to work for this generation. He's not saying he's not going to show them anything, because he does. I mean, even his own death, burial, and resurrection, he says, is a sign. It's a sign of Jonah. Right? He's buried for three days and he comes back from the... So there will be signs, but there will not be a sign that's good enough when you're addicted to assurances. When you're addicted to affirmations. When you're addicted to proof. And then there's some proof and I need more proof. And then I need more proof. And then I need more proof. And then I need more proof. The... The word that Jesus uses here, he says, he says, why does this generation seek a sign? That word seek is the word epizeteo. It comes from the word epizeteo, which is the Greek word. It's a combination of two words. Epi uh, is where we get um, our word for um, like perimeter. Uh, it's a ep, ep, is ep, epi, per, what does it say? epizeteo so it's where we get epi or epicenter uh, it's perimeter it's, it's something around the center of something and then zeteo is to really it can mean to worship to prioritize to focus on so, and, it's, and it's in the present tense which means it's a continuous thing that's constant it's not that they sought one time for a sign or two times but he says why really in English he's saying why does this generation why are they so obsessed with signs why are they so hungry constantly for assurances because there's all these assurances there's all these signs that they've already had why are you still epi walking around and then Zeteo, worshiping, seeking, prioritizing. Why are you constantly, like, like literally they, they came to Jesus, who he is the greatest sign. They came to the sign, asked for a sign from the sign. And the sign said, wait, wait a minute, why, when are you going to stop walking around me? Why are you constantly walking around the person of Jesus saying, man, I sure wish that he would just build, give me some evidence here. He's like, no, I, I am the evidence. You're talking to Jesus, and Jesus is the evidence. And so I know the Pharisees, I, I know what happened to them. They ended up rejecting Jesus. But I'm, I'm, I'm concerned that, that many of us can do the exact same thing. We can see the power of God. We can believe in the person of God. But there's something inside of us that drives us to constantly be hungry for more evidence. More proof that God is who he says that he is. More proof that God is faithful. More proof that God is with me. More proof that God has forgiven me of my past. And the generation that constantly needs proof is in a pointless pursuit of proof. They're addicted to assurances. But why would you become addicted to assurances? One, assurances feel good. But two, because we all wrestle with anxiety. And anxiety wants to be relieved. So, so really, I feel like in the, the, the center of this message is, is the reality that, that this, gener this generation that Jesus talks about in our generation, we don't know what to do with anxiety. We don't know what to do with the feeling of, I need assurance. I need evidence. And so what we usually do is we try to eliminate anxiety or at least shrink it. We try to uh, boil it down a little bit, calm it down. And usually our attempts to calm our anxiety or, or our, and our doubt, I mean, you could throw in all kinds of negative feelings here when you're following God. There's fear, there's anxiety, there's doubt. And these are the same things I think that the Pharisees are dealing with. They are coming to Jesus and they're asking for a sign in order that it says that they might test him. And the word test there means they're looking for, for objective truth. Only they're not actually looking for truth. They're looking for proof. Those are two different things. But their anxiety has told them that there's something about this Jesus character. 
right? He was born in Bethlehem. There's a lot of interesting things about him, and they know the word of God, and so to them, they think perhaps he might be. And so they go meet with Jesus in order to see if he can eliminate their doubt, because they feel like if he eliminates their doubt, then they will believe. But when you ask for a sign, you're not actually eliminating doubt, you're eliminating faith. Because faith is the absence of sight. And if you give evidence, you eliminate faith. But that's why you can't listen to your doubt. Because your doubt is lying to you. Your doubt will tell you, hey, if I could just have visual evidence, if I could just have some kind of proof today that God loves me, that he's forgiven me of my sin, that he's with me, if I could just have some proof, then I would go away. That's what your doubt tells you. But like I was telling my son the other day, anxiety will never go away. (laughs) Why would doubt pack up its bags and leave your heart when it's so comfy there? It will never voluntarily leave. It tells you that it will leave, but what it's doing is it's not eliminating itself. It's eliminating faith. And Jesus said, what happens is Jesus walks away from them and he says, I'm not going to give you what you're asking for. I'm not going to give you what you want. Instead, I'm going to give you what you need. And what you need is an opportunity to believe, to have faith. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. And so I believe that God is giving many of us opportunities for faith And we don't receive them, we don't take them, we don't take advantage of them because we're too busy listening to our doubt, to our fear, to our anxiety. They did a study on anxiety and um, there's several studies done. I was uh, listening to one this week about they took a bunch of eighth graders that are in a stressful time in their life. Anybody been in eighth grade before? It's a little bit stressful. And uh, the eighth graders are in a stressful time in their life. And so um, many of them are wanting to try out for, you know, the, uh, the football team. They're wanting to audition for uh, the, the, the play. They're wanting to uh, run for student council. But, they're, but they're, they're anxious about these things. I mean, it's kind of scary to be an eighth grader anyway. And then there's these other things that just build up their anxiety and so they met with them and they, they on a scale of one to ten how, how, how anxious are you about school this year and about these different choices that you have to make and, and they rated themselves around seven or eight some of them nine their level of anxiety was fairly high and then they let the eighth graders go about their school year and do what they wanted to do whatever they chose to do and then at the end of the school year they followed up some questions with them and asked them what they ended up doing and so some of them Uh, did not try out for the football team. Some of them did not uh, audition for the play. Um, They did, whatever was causing them anxiety, they didn't didn't do it. And so they interviewed them afterward and they said, okay, well, why did you not try out for uh, the football team? Why didn't you audition for the play? And they said, well, because uh, it was the only way for me to not feel anxious was to not do that thing. And so you see then that motivation matters. You see then that, 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 that the eighth graders who, who pulled back from what they wanted to do, they pulled back because there was something they wanted more. They wanted less anxiety. And so they pulled back from what they wanted in terms of trying out for the football team and auditioning for the play. They didn't do those things because there was something they wanted more, which was to get rid of anxiety but you know what happened when they asked them how anxious do you feel now you were seven eight nine at the beginning of the school year how anxious do you feel now as you think about summer and you think about asking that girl out or whatever it is well it's about seven eight or a nine their anxiety levels stayed about the same even though their main focus was reducing anxiety turns out if your main focus is reducing anxiety You don't actually reduce anxiety, you reduce your world. You shrink your world. Because now, well, you can't try out for the football team. You can't audition for the play. Definitely can't ask her out. You can't go into the room because you have social anxiety and there's a lot of people in there. And so it starts shrinking. If your main goal is to avoid anxiety, you don't actually avoid it. You feed it. 
Because you do exactly what anxiety tells you to do. Oh, don't go in there. Oh, don't, don't try that. Well, don't go to church today. You're, you, you haven't had a good week. <laughs> don't, go, be, don't, don't, don't go to care group. Be in a living room with a bunch of people. You, you know how you are around people. You don't want to do that. Your world begins to shrink. Your, your anxiety doesn't shrink, but your world shrinks. And, 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 and so what happened is they, they invited the other kids and the other eighth graders who actually did things. They tried out for the football team. They auditioned for the play. And they asked them, why did you do that? You were so anxious about doing those things. Why did you do it? And the overwhelming answer was, well, uh, I tried out for the football team because it's the only way to get on the football team. <laughs> In other words... Again, there was a different motivation. So it's not that some of us have anxiety and some of us don't. It's that some of us have a different relationship with our anxiety. Because if you want an, uh, an anxiety-free life, if you want a doubt-free life, if you want to live without any doubt, there, there's only one way to do that, and that is to die. <laughs> only dead people have no anxiety. Only dead people, uh, you know, hashtag dead people goals, I guess, you know. But I'm just saying, all of us have social anxiety. All of us have, and, and some of us more than others. And there's diagnosable levels, and there's, there's different levels of OCD, of course. And so I'm not a doctor, but I'm just telling you that all of us experience fear. All of us experience doubt. Your pastor experiences doubt. And so it's not that I don't have any doubt. It's not that I don't have any anxiety. But scripture says, be anxious for nothing. In other words, don't let that anxiety overcome your life. Don't let it shrink your life. Don't let your doubt shrink your faith. If your main goal is to get rid of all doubt out of your life, then all you really do is shrink your life. And I've had people come to me, oh, Pastor Harry, I would serve in such and such a ministry, but I don't like to commit to things and then not be able to follow through. And I'm like, so translation, if I committed to serve in this ministry, I probably wouldn't show up. Oh, oh, how big of you. That's a, that's a lovely, what? Wait, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, it's, I mean, it's, 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 it's kind of like dating a girl for seven years and she's like, I really want you to marry me. It's like, well, I would marry you, but when I marry, I want it to be for love. You know, I mean, well, at some point, you find a different guy. You know what I'm saying? Like, this isn't working out. <laughs> because what, she's, what he's saying is that he doesn't love you enough to marry you. And I don't know about you, but my standard's a little bit higher than that. I need somebody who actually loves me and feels that this might go somewhere. You know what I'm saying? But, but, but we all deal with anxiety, but the difference is the motivation. If our main motivation is to feel less doubt and less fear and less anxiety, then what that'll do is that'll shrink our ability to serve God, to know God, to experience God. It's the same thing with people who say, well, I can't tithe right now. I can't give 10% of my income because, well, you know, I, I'm not making enough. But it's a percentage. So 10% of a dollar is, is a dime. You can, you can do that. The truth is, if you can't give when you're making uh, 40000 a year, you're not going to be able to give when you're making 80000 a year. Just think how much money that is. <laughs> $8,000 a year. Wow, I can't afford that. You'll never be able to afford it. This is why almost all the commands of God are faith commands. He is calling us not to obey out of a calculation that we can do this. He's calling us to obey out of faith that he will empower us to do whatever we need. And, and, so, and so the issue with regard to anxiety and doubt and the, the, the approval or the, the, the affirmation, the assurance addiction is not to try to shrink your doubt, but rather to find something that is greater than your doubt, something that you love more, something that you desire more than merely feeling less of whatever it is. And so God wants to expand us. Philippians 3 is the other passage of scripture that I think gives us some great insight into this. He says, finally, my brethren, rejoice 
in the Lord. And you're going to find that in Philippians, Paul mentions that quite frequently. In fact, Philippians 4 is the famous passage where he says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Well, here he says, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same thing to you is not tedious, but it's safe for you. In other words, he's like, I know I told you to rejoice a couple of times. I'm probably going to tell you some more. And I'm not just repeating myself. It's not redundant. This is very helpful for you. And you'll see in a minute. He said, rejoice in the Lord. I'm telling you this is important. Verse 2, beware of dogs. <laughs> I talked uh, a few weeks ago about dogs. Um, I talked about how we're all dogs. This isn't that kind of dog. This is the kind of dog that is cast out. This is the kind of people who are not serving God. He said, Be beware of people who've already decided not to follow God themselves. They don't really take their advice. And then he says, beware of evil workers. And beware of the mutilation. What is the mutilation? Well, the mutilation is what we would call circumcision. And uh, this was a sign in the Old Testament of the covenant that God was making with Abraham. And God told Abraham that as a sign, as evidence, as assurance of his covenant with Abraham, he wanted him to, to do a little cutting down there. To do circumcision. Which was, you know, a little bit painful. And then God said, I want you to do this with all of the men in your family. And if they're not circumcised, they're not going to be a part of this covenant. And so even to this day, any Jewish male who, uh, yeah, that, that walks in Judaism, they're circumcised. Because they see it as a, a sign or an assurance of their covenant relationship with God. This is how we know that we're children of God because we had that operation that one time. <laughs> and, 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 and Paul says, beware of this. In other words, this is like 70 years after Jesus had rose from the dead. The church had already begun to grow. And yet it was becoming popular for, for people to look for assurances. How do I know that I'm saved? How do I really, really, really know that I'm saved? How do I really know? And so there were people that came along, maybe the dogs that Paul's talking about, who said, you know what? Back in the day, a sign of God's covenant in Holy Scripture is circumcision. They took them to a few different passages. There's a lot of them in the Old Testament. And they said, see, look, this is how you can really know that you're a covenant member of the body of Christ. You have to be circumcised. And so they were convincing people to have these surgeries because that will be evidence. The truth is, as long as faith has been around, the counterfeit of faith, which is an addiction to assurances has also been around. And people have been happy to feed that addiction. False teachers have been happy to say, you know what, you're right. This is what you can do right here. And so Paul says, beware. Paul calls it the mutilation, not circumcision. He says, no, no, this is just messing up your body. Now, again, the Holy Spirit, through Paul, he's not saying that he's against all circumcision. I know in America it was super popular last century. And so uh, if you want to do that, feel free to do that. But he's saying with regard to your faith as a sign of a covenant, this is dangerous. And he says, for we are the circumcision. <laughs> we are the circumcision. In other words, if you're looking for a sign, just look right here. If you're looking for a sign that God really loves you, just, just, just look in the mirror. If you're looking for a sign that God has really saved you, look at your own life. Is there evidence in your life? Have you laid down certain things and picked up other things? Have you seen changes in your own life? We are the sign. We are the evidence that God is good, that God is faithful, that God is loving, that God is merciful, that he's forgiving, that he's just. We are the sign. He said we are the circumcision. Don't you understand? Circumcision was a sign that people might know that they were connected to God in, in the covenant with God. Now you, you are it. You are the sign. Look at your own life and that's evidence the evidence is you the evidence is me and that's why personal testimonies are so powerful we share personal uh, uh manessa shared her personal testimony romeo shared his personal testimony down in san antonio last week because it's so powerful because we are the circumcision we are the sign that god is still alive we are the evidence of the working of god in the world 
Like, like you, you don't have to look any further other than simply to know somebody who's been touched by God. He said, we are the circumcision, and this is what we do. This is how we roll. Number one, we worship God in the Spirit. And that's so important. Instead of worshiping a sign, we worship God. We, 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 we are so enamored with God. We are so obsessed with God. We, we, we epizeteo around God. Like we're constantly looking for him. <laughs> we're con- yeah, sorry, not sorry. We're constantly looking for God. We're constantly seeking him in our daily life. We're not looking for signs or evidences that he's real or that he loves us. We're looking for him. We worship him. He alone is worthy of our worship. In other words, I'm not going to spend another day worrying, which is worship in the wrong direction. Worry is worship of what might happen. Right? I'm not going to spend another day worshiping what might happen. I'm too busy worshiping God who already knows what will happen. So my God is bigger than my worry. And as I elevate, now, 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 I, I, I shut down the voice of worry. I refuse the idolatry. I refuse idolatry to prop up some idol as if that's got power over me. As if my boss has power over me. As if the economy has power over me. As if Donald Trump or Joe Biden has any power over me or much anything else. I mean, and like I refuse to, to bow to these false gods because they're all liars. They've never transformed me. I've seen the faithfulness of God when, it, when the economy is good. I've seen the faith when, the, when it's bad. I've seen the presence of Jesus when things are good and when things are bad. I have been, what did Paul say? I've been hungry. I've been thirsty. I've been, I've been in all kinds of situations. But I've seen the betterness of Jesus in all of those circumstances. And you cannot convince me that those circumstances control my destiny. You cannot convince me. I've been under good leaders. I've been under bad leaders. I've been in great churches. I've been in lame churches. I've, I mean, I've been, I'm, like, you cannot convince me that these things shift people. Well, there was, well, my mom really messed me up. I tell you what, my, 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 my child had really messed me. Bro, no, no. It did, like, I have, like, I, I'm telling you, I refuse to worship anything other than God. Refuse the word. Refuse to worship any 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 worry or shame, which is a reminder of what happened in the past. In the future, in, in verse 15, Jesus is going to turn to his disciples right after this encounter, and he's going to tell them, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of Herod. Which we're going to get into that next week. The leaven is a it's a it's 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 an agent in the making of bread. So it's what creates the yeast in bread. Just a little history lesson. Bread is believed to be the oldest bakery item. Like it seems to be the first thing that anybody ever stuck into any kind of oven and decided to try to eat. (laughs) Is bread. Now ancient bread was made of three ingredients. Water, flour, and oil. Jesus, just it's just interesting to me, but Jesus said he was the bread of life. He also was three in one. And that's an interesting little component. But also, they, they believe that ancient bread could sustain life. Like you could live on bread. Don't try this on Wonder Bread or whatever you get at the grocery market, okay? I'm telling you, it's like rat poison. Like don't try this on modern day bread that you get from Walmart. But I'm just saying, back in the day when it was made of three ingredients, now it's made of like 3,000 ingredients I can't pronounce. But, but like classic bread was enough to sustain you for like a long period of time. So it's really interesting. And then, I don't know, around three, four thousand years ago, somebody, they believe in Egypt, developed uh, leavened bread. Uh, they, they, they believe it happened because they forgot to throw out some of the dough and, and it's a hot, sticky environment. And so it, it soured. It started to ferment. In other words, there started to be chemical reactions within it. Like there's bacteria, really. And so that bacteria, they were like, they, they tasted it. And they're like, oh, that tastes okay. We could probably stick some of that with our other dough. Stick it in the oven. And it comes out of this little stone oven. And it's poofy. And it's, and it's got this nice 
poofy texture. Instead of like a cracker, it's like, it's like moist. It's like, is it lunchtime yet? Come on, somebody. Is it? I mean, it's like, man, some good bread with butter. I mean, it's, it's flaky. There's all this air in, in the middle of it. The air is from the, from the chemicals reacting, from the bacteria reacting with the good, the bad interacting with the good. That's where, it's where, the, that's where the, all the, the air comes from, which makes it puffy and poofy and, I don't know, whatever, flaky and good. Well, in the Bible, God constantly used unleavened bread for all of his holy ceremonies. All right, so, so he commanded his people for these holy ceremonies, what you're going to put before him in the holy place, what you're going to eat on the day of atonement, all that kind of stuff. It's all unleavened bread. Why? Because God is against tasty bread? No. But because he wanted to teach them what sin was like. Sin is a person who has two opposing doughs within them. They have a lot of good and a little bit of sour. That's what sin is. And those two doughs fight within us. And Jesus said, beware of the leaven. Beware of the little bit of sour that's in the Pharisees. Christianity, for lack of a better word. Beware of the little bit of sour that's in Herod's. Because remember, Mark taught us about Herod earlier, where Herod was curious about Jesus and actually wanted to see Jesus. Well, that's some good dough right there. But then Mark told us why. Because he was ashamed of what he had done to John the Baptist, and he was afraid that Jesus was John the Baptist reincarnated. That's the sour part. So in other words, he wanted to get to know Jesus. Good. He was afraid of Jesus and ashamed of himself and unwilling to repent. Bad. And the two of those together make for a leavened loaf. In fact, the Bible says that a little bit of leaven goes through the whole thing. And the same thing with the, with the Pharisees. They're interested in Jesus. They think he might be the Messiah. That's lovely. But they need to see some proof, more proof. I need more proof and more proof. That's not good. And Jesus said, look, Beware of the double-mindedness. Beware of the, the double motives. Beware of the twin uh, worship. Where you worship God and whatever. In fact, God said you shall worship me only. You can't have any other gods beside me. And so this is what we do. Those of us that are the circumcision, number one, we worship God alone. And then we rejoice in Jesus Christ. We rejoice in Jesus. Again, he's telling us to rejoice. But now he's saying rejoice in Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. That word confidence means to seek assurance from. So we rejoice in Jesus. And we do not seek assurance from the flesh. What is the flesh? Well, it's this. It's what I see. It's what I think. It's what I hear. It's what I feel. It's what I smell. It's what I taste. It's, it's this, this body right here. It's seeking proof. And so we don't, he said, we don't, we don't get assurance from physical circumcision or church attendance or reading the Bible or attending some kind of prayer meeting or, or, doing, or checking something off. We don't get any assurance of our salvation from these things or getting visions or hearing from God or having a, a prophet lay their hand on our head. And we, don't, we don't get assurance from any of that stuff. We rejoice in Jesus. We rejoice in Jesus. So that's my challenge to you today. Is if, 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 you have, if you're feeling some doubt, if you're feeling some anxiety, don't try to shrink the anxiety because you will only shrink your world. Rather, expand your world by rejoicing in Jesus. So that when anxiety says, well, you know, you can't go to that small group because, well, you really don't, you, you don't do good in crowds with people. You say, okay, that's, that's true. That's true. I don't do good in crowds with people and I do feel anxious, but man, let me just tell you how good Jesus is. Can I tell you how great Jesus is? Can I boast? That's what it means. Rejoice means to boast or brag in, on Jesus, just like I was bragging on the lions. Can I just tell you how good Jesus is, how faithful Jesus is, how I've never walked into a room by myself I've always, I've had a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Can I tell you what a friend Jesus is? 
And I tell you how faithful he is, how kind he is, how patient he is, how loving he is. When my past starts to tell me about all the stuff that I, I, I'll never be forgiven for, let me tell you how forgiving Jesus is. Let me tell you how, how, how absolutely forgiving, how he washes white as snow, how he forgets stuff. Like, can I just tell you? And, and so rejoicing in Jesus in the face of anxiety, in the face of doubt, in the face of disappointment, in the face of fear, in the face of, of man, disillusionment, in the face of sadness, rejoicing in Jesus. Which, by the way, is another thing, man, I, I don't understand all these sad Christians. I, <laughs> I really don't. I just want to challenge you. Stop being so grumpy all the time. Be more like Jonathan. Stop being so grumpy all the time. Stop... Stop telling people it's the end of the world. Stop whining about, oh my gosh, it's the mark of the beast. And oh my, Like, okay, cool. You're into end time stuff. That's lovely. You do know that it's a wonderful thing. The word apocalypse means the unveiling of Jesus. So talk about it. Talk about how he is unveiling himself, how he is rescuing us, how he is greater. It's like you're so afraid of the beast and the mark and some kind of weird stuff going on. I mean, like Christians are some of the most fearful prepper people you're ever going to meet. They got their guns and they got their MR2s, is it, or whatever, because it's like the whole world's just going to fall apart at any given moment. Like, live a little. Relax. I mean, just have some fun. Like, enjoy the, the, the Cowboys game today, right? I mean, just enjoy life. Smile every once in a while. Well, well Pastor, hey, rejoice and happiness are two different things. Well, they're a little bit different, but they're not that much different. It's not like I'm rejoicing in my heart, but I'm just all gloomy in my face. Like, oh, no, I understand life is hard, but God is good. He's been good to me. He's been faithful, and he's going to be good. Whatever comes my way, I believe that he holds the future, and I'm looking to him. So I have no reason to be. I'm not saying my life is perfect, but I have no reason to be discouraged. I rejoice in Jesus. So go, go out, rejoice in Jesus. Would you just stand with me for just a minute? I just want to pray over you that you just receive some joy. Father, give us some joy today. As we, as we leave today, go home, hang out with our family, get on the barbecue, whatever we're going to do. Would you stir up joy in Jesus? May we rejoice in Jesus because he is the only sign that we need. He is the only. And, and Lord, we, we, we choose to put our faith in him. And we stop feeding our doubts. We stop feeding our anxieties. Sometimes it's real practical. Sometimes it's like you, you feel like you have to check the stove before you can actually go to sleep. Well, stop feeding that. Stop checking the stove. <laughs> have faith that even if you left the stove on for the first time in your life, Jesus is able to take care of it. <laughs> Scripture says he will, he, 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 will, he, will, he will let us have perfect sleep. He will, he will give us sleep, the gift of sleep, because of his peace. And so we, we know the Prince of Peace, and so we choose to stand in that peace. We choose to stop feeding into anxiety and fear and, and checking things all the time and redoing and rituals, relying on rituals. Hmm. This week I actually told Mike I was not going to pray for him before he went to bed. And uh, it's kind of a normal thing. And I, said, and I said, why do you want me to pray for you? He said, because I feel better when you pray for me. And I said, well, that's not the point of prayer. Because the truth is you can, you can feel better when your pastor prays for you because you have more faith in your pastor's prayer than you do in the power of God and the presence of God. Don't you know Jesus is right there in your bedroom with you? So I like, I, I like that you feel better after we pray. But what I would like is for you to be better and for you to grow in your faith. Because trust me, I'm praying. I told him, I said, I'm praying the whole, like I'm praying at night. I'm down here. You're up there in bed. I'm praying for you. Mom and I are praying for you. We're, we're praying. You're good. You got people praying for you. You need to believe it though. You need to have faith. You need to believe. You need to receive and put faith in what Jesus has already done. So if you've never done that before, I would encourage you right now just to receive the love of God, that he paid the price for your sin, that he died for your sin, and that he will forgive you if you will just ask him to, that he will come into your heart, that he will transform your life if you will just open yourself up to him. And the evidence 
is just your faith. When you believe it, that's, what, that's how you know that it's true. And so, Father, we do. We put our faith in the person of Jesus and what he's done for us on the cross, and we gladly receive salvation and forgiveness and hope and renewal, and we choose to rejoice in him today. And everybody said, amen. amen. You knew exactly what to say. That's awesome.